evening and welcome. I will go ahead and get us started while we have our last participants trickle in here. So my name is Courtney and I will be the session moderator for tonight. On behalf of CMA Jewel, we'd like to thank you for joining us for the Early Career Learner Speaker Series webinar. CMA Jewel is a Canadian Medical Association subsidiary dedicated to physician-led learning and leadership. And we've created this special series of webinars to provide you with the tools to navigate life outside of residency and the realties of practice. I'm speaking to you today from Ottawa, Ontario, the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. I would invite you to consider your own position with respect to the land where you live, work, and play, recognizing that the land was home to other people and communities before settlers. Here at the CMA, we look forward to forging new, culturally safe relationships and contributing to reconciliation. Acknowledging that the injustices experienced by Indigenous people of what we now call Canada continue to affect their health and well being, and there is much work to be done. The CMA was recently involved in a film project called The Unforgotten, and I would encourage you to watch even one of its short segments as it was created to incite reflection and spark conversations and how to make meaningful change happen in healthcare. And I'll go ahead and put the link in the chat here. Okay, put that there for your reference. That's the unforgotten. And so today's session will be recorded and we strongly encourage you to ask whatever questions that you may have through the Q&A feature, which you'll find in the lower banner uh, ribbon of your Zoom. So we know this is a challenging time for physicians and we want to acknowledge our gratitude uh, for the incredibly hard work, dedication, and sacrifices you all make, even more so now than ever. We'd like to let you know that we have hundreds of resources available on the Physician Wellness Hub to help physicians with their well-being, and I'll also include that link here for your convenience. So there, that is our Physician Wellness Hub link. And today, we are fortunate to have a panel of Dr. McNeil, Dr. Stigant and Dr. Miller with us to present the talks today. And I will now pass the mic over to Dr. Miller. Thank you so much, Courtney. Uh, hello and welcome to this session, which as you know, is part of the CMA Dual Early Learning Series with this specific session um, put on in collaboration with Cascades, which is a new national initiative for climate action and awareness in healthcare that is funded by Environment and Climate Change Canada. I'd like to start by introducing myself and my colleagues and acknowledging uh, the traditional ter territories uh, from across Turtle Island where we are joining you from today. I am a professor at the University of Toronto. I direct the Center for Sustainable Health Systems and also Cascades, which I just mentioned. And I'd like to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates and where I live. For thousands of years, these have been the lands of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. Next slide, please. I'd like to introduce you also to my colleague, Dr. Carolyn Stigant, who is a nephrologist at Island Health. She's the medical lead for home hemodialysis at the Royal Jubilee Hospital and is a clinical assistant professor at UBC or University of British Columbia. And she's the inaugural chair of the Sustainable Nephrology Action Planning Committee of the Canadian Society of Nephrology. Dr. Stigant, is speaking to you today from the traditional territories of the Songhees, the Esquimalt, and the Wasanich nations. And she's shown us here a picture of Gary Oak Meadow on southern Vancouver Island, near where she lives, one of the most endangered landscapes in Canada. And these are landscapes that have long been cared for by the First Nations people through selective harvesting and controlled burns. That purple flower, the Camassia has a root bulb that was the primary starch in the local diet and the acorn trees there were staple food in fall and winter months. I'd also like to introduce you to Dr. Andrea McNeil, who is a surgical oncologist at Vancouver General Hospital and the BC Cancer Agency. She is a clinical associate professor at the University of British Columbia, where she specializes in sarcoma and peritoneal malignancies, and she directs the Planetary Healthcare Lab at UBC and helps lead Cascades. Planetary Healthcare Lab is one of the founding partners of Cascades as a national initiative. Dr. McNeil is speaking to you today from the traditional territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the tsleil peoples, and she wishes to thank them for their stewardship 
of these lands, their generational knowledge, wisdom, and teachings. And with that, I'd like to turn to the context for our talk with you today. Um, and the context is, on the one hand, uh, what we increasingly understand about the health and health system impacts of climate change. I have here on the left a couple of the reports that point that out, although really um, it's not so much that IPCC report from last August that pointed to the physical science basis of climate change, but the one that came out yesterday, I believe it was, from the Sixth Assessment Working Group 2 on impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability that sets out the scale of the challenge for health and health systems, the adaptations required. And that other report there, which is from Health Canada, which is part of Canada's commitment to a national adaptation plan and figuring out what, where are the vulnerabilities uh, for health, for health systems, because climate, climate change will and is affecting our health and is creating risks and challenges for the operation of our health system. So that's really the left part of this slide and the context for this conversation. The right part of this slide is the irony that the healthcare system, which is affected by climate, is also part of the problem. So here we have an article that by my colleague, Dr. Andrea McNeil and her colleagues, uh, that did, who did the first national assessment of the environmental impact of Canada's healthcare sector, which um, produces almost 5% of national emissions, which is in accordance with many uh, developed countries around the world and taken together, the healthcare sector around the world, health systems around the world are, would make um, as about 4.6 of global emissions, which makes it a very significant emitter uh, among, uh, among big emitters on the planet. So we have the irony and the challenge of having the health of, of populations of individuals and communities profoundly impacted uh, in unequal and in inequitable ways, and the health system challenged in its operation and ability to function, even as uh, we know that part of what we're doing to deliver care contributes to the problem. Next slide, please. We are at a good time, even if a challenging time, because the other part of the context for this talk is the increasing effort to mobilize health systems and health professionals in responding to these challenges. And many of you will know that at the Conference of Parties meeting, COP26, last November in Glasgow, health and health systems were featured uh, even more than they have been previous of these international conferences. And indeed, there was a very important health program pulled together by the WHO and other groups like the English National Health Service, which has been a global leader to galvanize national commitments across the world. And Canada, along with the US and over 40 other countries committed to deliver both climate resilient health systems and health systems that are low carbon and sustainable. So we have now, I think importantly for the first time, a federal commitment and realization that the health sector is and needs to be a very active part of building towards a low carbon economy by 2050. We know that several of the provinces are already moving in this direction, but I think this is an added um, impetus for action and support for action. And meanwhile, initiatives like Cascades uh, and other groups around the country that we work with um, represents and tries to galvanize some of the capacity which is growing and which many of you in the audience also help to represent. Uh, and so I think we are, yes, facing a challenging time, but a, a time when there is considerable opportunity uh, to collectively uh, make a change. And with that, I'll pass uh, the mic over to Dr. Uh, Stigert. Great, thank you very much. Uh, these are my disclosures. Next slide. Yeah, so we've had an introduction here uh, from Dr. Miller uh, about this terrible situation that we're in. Um, and in the upper left part of this graph is where we're going to start um, looking at the significant rise of carbon dioxide emissions, um, not news to anybody on this call, but perhaps news that the concentration of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere is increasing 100 times faster than they have at any other time in history. And when I say history, I mean 800,000 year history. We know this from uh, scientists obtaining um, tiny air bubbles and analyzing their CO2 content uh, from deep within the ice sheet. Um, also, um, the concentration of greenhouse gases is double that 
um, of a historic average um, from pre-industrial times. And I want us as physicians to focus for a minute on the implications of physiology, of a doubling of a physiologic variable uh, like CO2, like pH. And we'd all understand uh, the very dramatic effect that has on our body systems. And it truly enrages me that we're in this situation due to carelessness. Um, and we, we will do better and we must do better. So these increase in emissions, uh, moving right on this plot, you can see uh, through the greenhouse effect, we've all heard how the temperature increases. And to reference this problem, we're now on average from pre-industrial times over one degree warmer. That's the, the earth at large. Canada, because we're Northern and the poles are warming more, Canada has um, heated by two degrees and our North even more by three degrees. So some people might say, so what? What's one degree? What's three degrees? I can't even feel that. 11,000 years ago at the time of our last ice age, the temperature, mean temperature difference between now and then was five degrees. And that is very alarming when you think that our north is more than halfway to the ecologic difference from an ice age ago. So rising temperature, we've all heard it melts the sea ice. Again, the concern there being many uh, ecologic implications and health. 40% of people live within 150 kilometers of uh, the sea or the ocean. And although 150 kilometers may seem a long way away, if it's flat and if it can be overwhelmed or if coastal water sources and sources of vegetation and livelihood are overwhelmed, leading populations to retreat, we're talking massive, massive impact. Further to the right on this curve is the effect on uh, weather patterns. And we feel in BC that we've been um, uh, unfortunately witness to um, some of these events. So drastic weather, and it may be wind, it may be rain, it may be too little rain um, and too much sun and too much temperature. So let's factor in these ecologic factors with um, what I would say are human factors. We live in a variety of different areas, perhaps a low-lying Pacific island, perhaps one of the coastal areas I'd mentioned, perhaps inner city in a poor area where there's lots of pavement and not a lot of cooling, perhaps in an under-resourced country as an agricultural worker without a policy that might protect us from the heat of the sun or volume depletion. And through these different exposure pathways at the bottom are various examples of health outcomes. So I'll just walk from left to right across this slide. It's not too difficult for us to picture how extreme weather events might cause, for example, traumatic injury. We saw moving to the right here in BC, the heat stress, 595 people died in British Columbia over the course of four days from heat stress, something that none of us were really trained to look for. Air quality, there's a uh, longer um, pollination season. Um, there's, uh, there's sort of natural um, uh, allergens that may occur in the air and there's also pollutants. We'll get to that air quality um, in just a moment. But um, significant triggers for asthma or COPD here um, and pulmonary infections. There may be too much water in places that water has not historically been. And I'll just jump to the right there about the vectors because that will affect insects, of course. And so here in Canada, um, we've seen a rise in West Nile virus, particularly in Western Canada, um, and some tick-borne diseases, particularly in Central Canada. The food supply and safety and social factors in my mind are intrinsically linked. Um, there's been tremendous migrations of peoples already that I think have been incorrectly attributed to um, social issues, social unrest, war issues. But I think fundamentally there's a, there's a competition for land that is starting that puts tremendous strife. Um, people are on the move, we're competing for limited resources, there is food scarcity. And sadly, I think we'll see more of this. And next slide, please. 
This depicts these issues here in Canada. So they've sort of highlighted the, the key um, issues in each area, but these are by no means mutually exclusive to the geographic part of Canada that's featured. And I want to draw attention to northern Canada, again, with the significant warming that's happening there and the traditional loss of um, ability to uh, maintain one's livelihood on the land. Um, so there's a difference in where animals are distributed. There's a difference in the ice, the safety of being on the ice, of living a traditional lifestyle. So tremendous anxiety for our northern neighbours. Next slide. So it certainly surprised me when I started looking into this area that one in four deaths worldwide currently are linked to the environment. And it surprised me even more that two thirds of those are non-communicable. So I would have pictured, you know, accidents or infectious pathogens or, or the like. But if you look at the top 10 causes here, number one and number two are stroke and ischemic heart disease. So we're going to get into that. Um, moving to the left on this graphic of where is it happening, North America is relatively spared. And I actually don't think we're as spared as all of that. I think we're just attributing certain things uh, to, to other causes or not recognizing the impact of environmental factors when we code deaths as being stroke or ischemic heart disease related. But we're also relatively protected because we're not as relatively um, as highly an industrialized area as the others. Next slide. So the fossil fuel component of air pollution is responsible for the majority of the majority of the deaths. And there's some data here on that. Next slide. So how might this happen? So I'm not sure if anyone has heard of particle pollution. I had not. Um, this denotes uh, one of the factors of the air quality warning, um, and it's they're called PM 2.5 in some instances. These are 2.5 microns or smaller in diameter. There's not one chemical that makes up particle pollution. It's a grab bag, and it's variable by where you live and what sort of industrial activities or um, development is in your area. So it's made up of a mixture of um, combusted carbon um, end products, um, uh, material called crustal material, like uh, concrete dust, sulfates, nitrates. And the, the point is they're all really small and they bypass our upper airway defenses. They get deep down within the lungs. They can actually pass through the alveoli into our circulation. And essentially the air and the contaminants in the air diffuse into our body. And from that point, we have activation of the um, systemic uh, inflammatory response. And this is proatherogenic. So this is borne out in a significant, I haven't included the references here, but there's a lot of literature that looks at uh, chronic exposure and increasing vascular endpoints, as well as acute exposure, leading to the more um, abrupt events um, and physiologies that are described on this slide, such as plaque rupture. So once the atherosclerosis accrues, that plaque can rupture, we can have thrombosis and acute events. So that's the rationale for, for brain and heart events. I want to emphasize as well that the kidneys are implicated in this process too, being vascular organs. And one analysis has predicted that, uh, or has um, determined 60,000 incident cases of chronic kidney disease in Canada are attributable to this cause. So I think this is a silent wave that's coming. Next slide. I'll hand it over to my colleague here. Thank you, Dr. Stigant. Now, in addition to understanding the impacts of climate change on health, which Dr. Stigant has just beautifully articulated, we also need to understand, my slides are no longer advancing, perfect, how climate change will imperil our ability to deliver healthcare in the way that we've become accustomed to. And this is an infographic that's published by Vancouver Coastal Health's Public Health Group, depicting the impact of climate change, not only on health, but on health systems. And this necessitates what we call adaptation in the climate world, which is preparing for the inevitable impacts of climate change and building resilience into our system against future disruptions. And as Dr. Stigant alluded to, we in BC last year experienced a series of climate catastrophes 
that not only had devastating public health impacts on our, our general population, but also significantly interrupted our ability to deliver care. So during that heat dome, our hospitals were so overwhelmed with heat related illness that all elective surgeries were canceled for a number of days. During the historic wildfire season, we had to evacuate hospitals or long term care facilities from the interior of BC. And then the atmospheric river in the fall washed out critical infrastructure such that dialysis patients could not get to their treatments. I had cancer patients who could not get to their daily radiation treatments and their oncologic care was significantly compromised by these events. Now I understand from my public health colleagues that this degree of disruption was expected but not projected to happen for years. And this is in keeping with yesterday's IPCC report that has painted a bleaker near-term future than was previously expected. And as Dr. Miller laid out in the introduction, there is actually a bi-directional relationship here between climate change, health, and healthcare, in that not only are we and our patients impacted by climate change, but we are also significant contributors to the problem. The task of reducing our impact on the climate is called mitigation, and that's the partner of adaptation in the climate world, and these efforts have to be intentionally co-created. Now, if we apply this lens of the interconnectedness of human and environmental health, specifically to the healthcare system, we arrive at what I have termed planetary health care. And I think that this concept begins with an expanded notion of our duty of care from simply that individual patient in front of us to other patients, both present and future, to the general population and to the planet. And this is beautifully encapsulated in this Lancet call for an updated Hippocratic Oath for the Anthropocene that I would encourage you all to read at your leisure. A year ago, we published a framework for planetary health care with the purpose of conveying the scope and the scale of systemic transformation required, and to try to dispel the myth that sustainable healthcare is equivalent to waste management. So I'm gonna provide a brief overview of this framework, and then Dr. Stigant and I will illustrate the application of it to medicine and then to surgery, to try to inspire you to operationalize it within your own practices. And the first thing you have to understand about this is that every healthcare activity has a footprint. Every treatment you provide or test you order consumes material resources and energy and generates waste. So anything that reduces the incidence or severity of disease, thereby decreasing the amount or intensity of care required is climate change mitigation. And to do this, we need universal access to preventive services and good chronic disease management in order to keep patients' interaction with the healthcare system at the lowest level of resource intensity and to optimize their determinants of health to keep them from needing care. The second operating principle of planetary healthcare is matching the supply of health services to demand, which means avoiding both overuse and underuse of healthcare. Underuse of necessary services like vaccines and cancer screening leaves patients vulnerable to avoidable disease. Overuse of health services results in avoidable harms to patients, in financial harms to health systems, and to environmental harms. And inappropriate or low value care is care in which risks or harms outweigh the benefits or care that will not influence your clinical decision making or change outcomes. I think that appropriateness of care is a neglected dimension of healthcare quality. And we know that it stems from both system factors like healthcare structures and funding, and also from clinician and patient behaviors. Our third operating principle is decarbonizing healthcare or reducing emissions from the supply of health services. And this includes the classical notions of sustainable healthcare like green buildings, energy management, and, and transport fleets. But those have typically not been within the purview of the clinician. We also, in this tier, have an enormous opportunity with, supply, with respect to healthcare supply chains, which we now know comprise the majority of healthcare emissions, and ways of delivering care in more efficient, coordinated, equitable, and low carbon ways. Now, the literature describes three levels of social accountability in clinical care, and we've adopted this to create what we're calling a ladder of engagement for clinician action around climate and ecological health. The micro level refers to actions that individual clinicians can take within the scope of their day-to-day -day practice. 
Meso level actions occur at an institutional level, so most often a hospital or a health system or within the local community. And macro level actions are undertaken by governments, by professional societies and regulatory and oversight bodies that have the capacity for sweeping top down mandates across the sector. As clinicians, we can influence all of these levels by adopting an advocate role or assuming leadership and administrative roles within our organizations. We've operationalized this framework for the individual clinician and published this in the BMJ a few months ago. So I refer you to this for a comprehensive overview of planetary healthcare. But Dr. Stigant is now going to take us through a case study of nephrology to highlight the opportunities that are presented by a chronic disease for low carbon resilient care. And she'll apply each of these operating principles to the treatment of chronic kidney disease. This could equally apply to other chronic diseases or to the practice of family medicine or other medical specialties. Yeah, thank you. So I call, um, I, I really echo uh, what Dr. McNeil had just said there about uh, cause and consequence. Um, climate change causes kidney disease and the management of end-stage kidney disease in particular contributes uh, to this load. And reflecting on this, I think nephrology practice is really at the nexus of all the issues that we're talking about today and is an interesting case study. Um, I don't know how many people are nephrology focused um, on the line. I'm going to guess that most of you aren't. And so with you in mind, I've tried to bring in little snippets of other specialties and make this relevant uh, for some of your practices and um, career pathways. So we have opportunity and obligation, as I call it. So um, kidney disease is really common. Um, all of you have looked after kidney patients. Um, many of them you probably didn't even know were kidney patients. They can have asymptomatic disease. And uh, as you likely know, when kidney failure happens um, in other conditions, be that uh, cirrhotic liver disease, be that um, chronic infections, um, malaria, bacterial infections, HIV infection, uh, with uh, diabetes, with um, congestive heart failure, patients do dramatically worse. So it's a risk multiplier for all conditions. The incidence of end-stage kidney disease is dramatically increasing. Um, the world, uh, the um, I, International Society of Nephrology has called um, kidney disease the most neglected of the neglected chronic diseases. Um, and on our watch, again, we have to do better. Um, marked increase uh, in incidence of disease, then just page down. It's really morbid. Um, it's projected now to be the fifth highest cause of years of life lost by 2040, dramatically on the rise. And the treatment for it is costly. I've shown you financial cost here. I, I should have included um, transplantation, which is um, in some sources a half or a third of the cost of dialysis. Um, but not only is it costly to the patient, it's costly to the funder, but it's costly to the environment. So again, these are the three bottom lines that we're talking about today. And next slide. Huge personal impact here. Um, there is increasing um, grief uh, amongst the care team about the waste. Um, there are questions about what can we do with this volume of waste. Um, this on the right, the graphic is a photograph that one of my home hemodialysis patients took. This represents one week of her garbage and it's only her dialysis supplies. This is not her regular household garbage. There's two other people in her household. Um, the remaining weeks worth of her dialysis garbage supply is taken to her brother's house. He lives in a condo, so she won't have to pay for it. Otherwise they were billing her for it. They were sending her letters saying, don't throw so much garbage out. And she came back to us and said, what can I do? Next slide. Uh, we've heard uh, very nicely um, in the preceding slides from my colleague about systems impact. And again, the, the need for adaptation to these is really exemplified within nephrology. We, had, um, we have a disaster plan that is, I'd say, fairly ironclad um, for, for medical field. And, um, and rightly so, after the recent atmospheric river and the floods, a lot of our home dialysis patients in particular um, ran uh, had issues of getting shipments to them in a timely manner. So how to jump in with resources. And I want to draw attention and commend uh, the amazing work of the, the group of people you see here. This is a group of hemodialysis nurses who worked in a town called Williams Lake. In 2017, the entire town had to be evacuated. Uh, so the, the dialysis unit, 
all the patients, all the staff included, uh, they went to a community about 120 kilometers away. Overnight, they learned how to use a new dialysis machine and they welcomed their patients the next day. So there's some success stories here, but we wish we didn't have to do that. There is a tremendous global impact on water, energy, and uh, single-use disposable, um, and the energy and uh, pollution associated with that from our end-stage kidney disease treatments. And I haven't featured peritoneal dialysis, uh, but the story is likely not too different from that. Next slide. So uh, before we get into uh, Dr. McNeil's um, approach um, and our personalization of it, I want us to really stress, I, th this was conceptually very helpful to me when I first started thinking about this problem of how to reduce carbon without reducing health. And I just want to really drive the point home that we're not talking about rationing, we're talking about optimizing patient's health, but I think being smarter about how to do that. And some of the ways in non-nephrology areas um, that prevention, uh, some of these are obvious, right? Like non-smoking, um, but you know, th thinking laterally on being active, um, bike, bike helmets uh, is an interesting prevention example. Um, uh, exercise regimens, another interesting one. Um, patient empowerment, um, perhaps people with depression or anxiety or various mental health problems to empower them with a skill set um, for self-management, um, assisted self-management, of course. An example of a lean pathway would be for people who wish to be organ donors or even recipients um, to, instead of have their tests um, coming over many days to expedite them and coordinate them so that it's a same day workup. That's an interesting um, concept we're working on locally. Um, low carbon alternatives might be substituting a dry powdered inhaler for a metered dose inhaler because there are um, very potent greenhouse gases that are emitted in the um, the meter dose inhalers. And an example of an operational resource use might be um, a reclamation of an anesthetic gas in the OR setting. So, so some examples to get you uh, motivated and thinking. So I, I really want to thank the Canadian Society of Nephrology for their leadership in allowing us to put this um, group of people across Canada together. Um, that's just really unrolling in the past few months, sustainable nephrology action planning. We've got a, our own logo uh, designed by my 14 year old daughter. Um, so a, a nice touch of home there. Um, vision and mission statements, as you see here, and I, we're really big on verbs, uh, education, innovation, advocacy. Um, we we want to get stuff done. Next slide. So um, taking that framework, um, a lot of health promotion, um, disease prevention, and chronic disease management is done in nephrology care, certainly, but a lot of it is done upstream of nephrology care. We really need a primary care, a referral care, um, a referral source care to engage with us. And so I thought I would just have a, um, rather than say, please manage chronic diseases effectively, I'd dive into that a little bit because I think everybody on the call probably knows that it's tough um, to do effective chronic disease management. So I think um, some strategies that I give you are um, motivated Motivational, learning how to have motivational um, assessments and discussions with patients, um, scratching below the surface a little bit, demonstrating really um, your um, contract with them and the fact that you care about their outcomes. An example of that is for smoking cessation when I'm talking to patients. I don't pretend to have the perfect approach to this, but I always ask people who stop smoking, how did you do that? Um, and, I'm, and I'm very pleased to hear occasionally they say, you cared and you asked me to do this. And I think that we can't underestimate the effect that we can have in some of our patients' lives. So that's one example. Um, we've, I've put on the left here some various ideas, um, but you know, reducing um, barriers to access. So we've got webinars, we've got podcasts, we um, can speak to patients on their terms, um, maybe having social media champions, uh, lay people um, embracing certain causes. So I think we can be innovative in how we speak to people. Um, another uh, is that, yeah, if we can do a few more points on that. I think that everyone on the call really needs to have, every practitioner, a rock solid approach to management of vascular diseases. Um, so diabetes, ophthalmology even, um, you're gonna be looking after people with hypertensive eye disease, uh, people with diabetic eye disease, um, liver, uh, chronic liver disease, uh, NASH, um, 
uh, vascular surgery, cardiac, you know, the list goes on. So everybody should know where their guidelines are found, the targets that you're treating to, um, inform your patients, challenge the patients to meet these targets. It takes work to manage this effectively. Also, this uh, notion of health and all policies framework, and here's the advocacy role, this sort of macro system role for, for colleagues. You could take on a variety of causes depending upon your care areas, interest, and expertise. And you know, one example might be um, uh, campaigning for um, agricultural use of antibiotics or not. Uh, pesticides, taxing or um, subsidizing um, foods um, to promote healthier eating habits, just lots of different ideas. And uh, next slide. To get more to their kidney world than in this one, I think there's some important um, messages from kidney care here. Um, the management of hypertension is cost effective. And I find it interesting in Canada that we pay for end-stage disease management, um, but I think we should be doing more uh, to fund preventative um, treatments. Um, another newer example of a, of a treatment that thankfully we have now are SGLT2 inhibitors, and it would be wonderful to see those funded in target populations to reduce the risk of people progressing to end stage. No one wants to reach end stage. For those who do reach end stage, they want a transplant. They don't want to be on dialysis. So we have to look at ways to increase transplant. And I talked about a lean service care pathway um, previously that may optimize that. We are industrial scale orders of lab testing. And I think we need some literature around the guidance, which are opinion-based, sort of best practices based for how often we should be measuring lab work. It's my observation that most of the major changes in patient status when they're started on dialysis or medications are changed, usually there's a symptom that they come up with. And I think that's an area ripe for a study of how often is it symptom or patient-driven that comes to our attention that we would then initiate um, additional testing on, on the background of their baseline testing. Um, in terms of appropriateness of care, we can dialyze people to closer to home, and there may be some savings there um, with carbon emissions associated with travel. And choosing wisely is a really important one. I would encourage you all to look at the Choosing Wisely website in your specialty and in related practice areas. Um, and even internationally, there's some interesting ideas. Um, and for us on dialysis, we want to make sure that the right people are receiving dialysis. Um, there is an option of conservative care um, for those who would uh, felt not to benefit from dialysis care. So ensuring that those patients are optimally supported in a non-dialysis care trajectory is also really important. And we're starting to look at and uh, communicate the importance of environmentally preferable purchasing. Next slide. Um, because we're major users of equipment and single use products, I think this one is, is a bit easier to picture. Um, we have opportunities to work with our industry partners uh, to challenge them to come up with lower carbon um, and zero waste um, treatment options. Um, we're hoping to work with transit authorities in um, uh, getting low carbon options to mandatory visits. Of course, dialysis, hemodialysis patients have to attend healthcare appointments three times per week. They don't have the option of a virtual care appointment. So decarbonizing transport is a big one for us. Um, and perhaps looking at innovative materials like more biocompatible um, or, or better managed plastics. I'll hand it over to, oh, not yet. I have a few more to go. Um, right, so back to you, to, to the audience then, what can I do? You have to think and function a little differently. And I hope we've given you some ideas here and you can just open up to all of these, um, Dr. McNeil, thank you. So on, on the micro front, um, I would say first and foremost, uh, measure your own carbon footprint. Um, there's some good websites here and challenge yourself to do better in your own realm. And it becomes fun. It's quite addictive um, and uh, it is very helpful to get you thinking about where the major sources of emissions are. It's critical to get patients to have uh, time outdoors. We know there's data that it's effective for chronic disease management, but also people will advocate more for nature preservation um, when they have a relationship with nature. So to compound um, our caring for the environment, this is really critically um, important. I've talked about um, the preventative um, and hopefully effective preventative um, practice. 
I've taken to having patients look at the weather report and pay more attention to the weather report. Make sure you've got a few weeks supply of medication. In the case of dialysis patients, make sure that you've got a few weeks of supply um, of, your, of, your, of your home stock um, and make sure that you've got a personal um, disaster plan as well as the program having one. And a, a special reminder here of um, underserviced, um, racialized and special needs populations uh, of which we have many. Um, they have unique health needs and please consider them in, in your planning. Um, we can reduce materials use when possible. Uh, I'll focus on that in just a moment. Another ask that I'll have a uh, message for you is please know in the institution in which you work, whether it's a larger clinic or whether it's a hospital setting, Make sure that every one of them has a sustainability plan. There's all kinds of resources, including on the handout that we've prepared for you for how your institution could approach this. This is key because um, you cannot function in a vacuum on this. This is systems-based. And then we've challenged you to think big as well. So on this um, last of my slides, um, I wanted to show you some of the things that we've looked at. I've partnered with a hospitalist um, in, our, in our hospital and we've got a planetary health aligned group. And we started thinking about things that really bugged us. And, and this is another um, sort of starting point that I would suggest that you could, could look at. For me, it was walking into a patient room and seeing five or six of these single cups on a tray. It's just ridiculous. So we're got, we've got our purchasing people getting uh, the blueware, Tupperware, getting rid of these um, single use. We've got campaigns on appropriate use of nitrile gloves. So um, there's lots of opportunity in your care setting. And I'm leaving you with uh, the last look um, in my last slide here with some local inspiration throughout the seasons, um, some beautiful sights to um, nourish the soul along the way. Thank you, Dr. Stagant. And now we're gonna switch gears and in our last few minutes, think about surgery to complement the medical perspective you've just heard. I'd like to try to convey the scope of the opportunity that surgeons have and how we can best focus our efforts. The OR is widely recognized to be one of the most resource intensive health services, and it's a significant contributor to the environmental impacts of health systems. In 2017, we published this carbon footprinting study of three hospitals in different countries, and it was a very granular carbon accounting exercise of everything that happens in the OR, because at that point I wasn't thinking more comprehensively about the practice of surgery. And we compared three tertiary care centers in different systems, and, and our findings showed three key things that I wanna to convey to you today. One was around the disproportionate impact of inhaled anesthetics and specifically desflurane on the OR carbon footprint. All inhaled anesthetic agents are greenhouse gases, but one desflurane is disproportionately worse than the others. And we found that the British hospital, which didn't have that drug on formulary because it's more expensive, had 10% the anesthetic emissions of the North American hospitals where it was in widespread use. Our second key finding was around energy consumption. We showed that HVAC systems, so heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems, account for 90 to 99% of OR energy use. And we showed the importance that clean energy has on our carbon footprint. As you can appreciate in the second line of this table in Vancouver, our energy footprint was one third of that in Minnesota because our electricity is from hydroelectric, hydroelectric sources and theirs is coal powered. And the third key finding was that emissions generated in the manufacture of the consumables that we use in the OR far outweigh those associated with their disposal. So I realized that the mountains of waste that we generate in the OR are the most visible and gut-wrenching of our environmental impacts. But in fact, the choice of consumables that we use in the first place is far more important than how we dispose of them. So these three findings have been instrumental in guiding our, mitigate, our mitigation efforts ever since. And since the time of this study, I've come to appreciate the role of decisions made and actions taken outside the OR and how these contribute to the footprint of surgery and how we can intervene along the entire continuum of care to minimize our environmental impacts while providing higher quality and more equitable care. So just like Dr. Stigant did for nephrology, let's just walk through the framework with respect to a surgeon's practice and appreciate that even if we can't influence our OR's HVAC system, we still have tremendous opportunities for impact. On the health promotion front, 
cancer surgery is a significant component of many surgical spe specialties, so we can embrace opportunities for cancer prevention or early detection. This includes things like optimizing cancer screening programs, but also adopting an advocacy role. And I can think of no better example of this than Dr. Frances Wright, shown here, who is a melanoma surgeon at Sunnybrook, and she, I believe, is now the head of surgical care for Cancer Care Ontario. She was instrumental in lobbying the Ontario government to have tanning beds banned to youth under 18. That's one more thing here. Um, with respect to chronic disease management, many surgeries are to treat the consequences of chronic diseases. So much as Dr. Stigant described, there are opportunities for good chronic disease management and optimization of comorbidities with the goal of preventing people from arriving at the point of ever needing surgery. So as she mentioned, liver, kidney, lung transplants, these are all the result of end-stage organ failures, which in many cases have modifiable risk factors. She also alluded to vascular surgery, which is driven by modifiable risk factors, and there are many other examples. Preoperatively, we have a number of different stewardship opportunities or ways that we can drive appropriate care. As surgeons, a big part of our job is determining who would benefit from surgery. And despite adages about hammers and nails, we do try to exhaust options for non-operative management and ensure appropriate patient selection. There have been 13 RCTs showing that knee arthroscopy is no better than physiotherapy for the treatment of osteoarthritis. And yet it took years for that data to have a clinical impact. And up until just a few years ago, this was still the primary indication for knee arthroscopy in Ontario. Part of patient selection is shared decision-making, which refers to the process of situating evidence within a patient's own worldview and helping them apply their own values and preferences to it. And RCTs have shown that up to 20% of elective surgeries would be unwanted if patients had access to unhurried, transparent, honest information. Our current uncoordinated care pathways often result in patients undergoing unnecessary investigations and treatments before arriving at their definitive treatment providers. Adhering to evidence-based guidelines for preoperative investigations can avoid, avoid non-value add tests. Kai Hai and Choosing Wisely released a report in 2017 looking at unnecessary care across seven areas of primary and specialist care, and they showed that up to a third of patients having low-risk surgery had unnecessary preoperative tests. Postoperative complications are bad for patients, but they also necessitate additional resource consumption for needing ongoing care, so optimizing patients for surgery to minimize their risk of complications is a component of planetary health care. In the post-operative setting, we have opportunities for stewardship within our inpatient management, and Dr. Stigant alluded to the frequency of blood work. We did a study showing that we were over-ordering unnecessary blood work in 76% of our patients, so there's a huge opportunity here. We also need to critically appraise current practices, like the value of daily chest x-rays in patients who are intubated or have chest tubes, or reflexive PPI use for gastric protection in a critical care population, this has actually been shown to cause harm. And we need mechanisms to de-adopt these practices that add no value. And lastly, I'd suggest that we need to encourage best practices, which are obviously part of quality care, um, but demedicalizing patients as quickly as is appropriate after surgery avoids iatrogenic complications like UTIs or bacteremia from central lines, all of which prolong stays, increase the resource intensity of care, and they're bad for patient outcomes and experience. And of course, within surgery, we have many options for the delivery of low carbon care. As I mentioned in our study, we showed that HVAC systems are responsible for the majority of our OR energy use. We also found that most ORs are maximally vent ventilated 24 seven, whether they're in use or not. And we modeled scenarios in which we set them back to the minimum acceptable level when not in use. And we showed that we could cut our energy consumption in half. With respect to healthcare supply chains, uh, reduction is the highest level principle in what we call a circular economy. Um, and we several studies have shown high levels of systematic waste in surgery with many consumables that are routinely opened and rarely or never used. There's a group in Toronto that's applying AI technology to inform strategic streamlining of surgical instrument trays and showing considerable cost savings and material resource use and waste. I would suggest that we default to reusables 
almost all of the studies called life cycle assessments that we have comparing different products have shown significant environmental savings with reusables. So when in doubt, default to these, and then use your advocate role to try to influence your organization to preferentially purchase reusables. Now, even appropriate care can be inefficiently delivered. So better coordination can reduce emissions both from patient travel and from repeated interactions with the system. And this is particularly relevant in cancer care. Oh, my Wi-Fi froze. We can still hear you perfectly you? clear. Okay, I'll just stop my video and just keep talking then. Okay. Um, that is a most unfortunate place for it to have frozen. Um, can you still see the screen share? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I don't know why that just happened, but let me get back to that slide and we will resume. I do apologize. We are here. Okay, there we go. Um, yeah, so what I was saying was that in cancer care, uh, patients often need to see specialists from surgery, medical and radiation oncology that were really bad at coordinating uh, to provide those together. IT systems can allow Sorry, I don't know what's happening here. IT systems can allow care to be delivered remotely. So in BC, I can order imaging anywhere and view the results. And this avoids patient travel, improves patient experience, and it also avoids duplication of care from incompatible systems. And finally, appropriate use of virtual care can also avoid patient travel, and it's an important component of health equity in opening up access to specialist care to our rural and remote populations. I'm very quickly just going to, I think, finish on this example because I want to give us time for Q&A. So I'm just going to give us an example from anesthesia, which we would consider, consider part of the provision of surgical care to demonstrate the co-benefits of low carbon care and the alignment that we see with improved quality and patient experience. So as I mentioned, inhaled anesthetics are potent greenhouse gases. And you can appreciate from this bar graph on the top right that strategies that include inhaled anesthetics shown in the top two bars are orders of magnitude worse for the climate than alternatives like total intravenous anesthesia uh, or regional blocks. We've recently surveyed a number of institutions that implemented regional anesthesia programs for breast surgery, either immediately before or during the pandemic, largely motivated by a desire to avoid aerosols. Um, and they have universally reported overwhelmingly positive outcomes from both the patient system and societal perspective. Um, very quickly, patients do not have post-operative nausea and vomiting like they do with general anesthetics. They have very good analgesia, which facilitates their recovery, allows them to go home sooner. This has allowed us to have a higher throughput and begin to address our COVID backlog of surgeries. And from a social perspective, it's also allowed us to reduce opioid prescribing, which is particularly important given that public health pandemic. I'm gonna skip over uh, this last bit and just finish so that we can have some Q&A uh, and reinforce the idea that both mitigation and adaptation are necessary components of a low carbon resilient health system that incorporating planetary health principles into medical practice uh, includes opportunities for prevention, stewardship, and low carbon care, and that this is often higher value care with many co-benefits for patients, systems, and society. So with that, I'll wrap up and turn it back to Dr. Miller to moderate our discussion. Super, thank you very much. That was terrific. We do have a couple of questions um, in the chat. So I'll start with um, a question from Lindsay Russell about the extent to which events like COVID have impacted healthcare. Have they minimized the carbon footprint? Uh, are there other ways in which they've influenced practice? I can well, go first on that. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and say there's, there's both good and bad. Um, conceptually, the pandemic has been good in demonstrating the agility of historically behemoth and non-agile health systems. Uh, and and demonstrating our ability to mobilize in response to an existential threat. I would suggest we need to channel that same energy into our response to the climate crisis. Uh, it has been good in motivating innovations in healthcare delivery, such as the delivery of regional anesthesia instead of general anesthesia, which has those myriad co-benefits. It has unfortunately also prompted uh, a lot of uptake of single-use consumables and generated a lot of new medical waste 
The WHO released a report a couple of weeks ago around pandemic waste, specifically PPE, and the impacts are staggering. So hopefully we can kind of shift course on some of those negatives and, and capitalize on some of the lessons learned and the, uh, the innovations that we've gained from the pandemic to, to help chart uh, a, a better path forward. I had a, a few thoughts on that as well, um, and would echo a, a positive and and a negative uh, in that regard. And I think the rise of virtual care um, in um, chronic disease management has has been an obvious benefit. Patients really like it, um, and it, I think it helps us um, to have a better continuity of care with a lot of people who have been uh, sometimes challenging to bring into the office setting. Sometimes that's a personal preference and sometimes that's geography related. So that would be an obvious plus. Um, but a downside on a medical perspective is the late presentation with disease that we're seeing. We've heard a lot about people staying away. Uh, you know, maybe the chest pain isn't an MI, I'm not gonna go to the emergency. And so we're seeing a lot of later presentations with uh, the sepsis, certainly uh, with heart problems. Those are the two that, that jumped to mind. But echoing what you said about the, the disposables, just marked increase. Great. Um, so I'm going to just put the last two questions forward and then because I know we, we, uh, we don't have a lot of time. So one is just about preparing the future health workforce. Um, is this part of training curricula? Is it in the medical training programs? And I know this varies. I don't know if you have thoughts on that. And the other is sort of um, about somebody who's beginning their practice as a rural family medicine resident and asking about resources to help build a sustainable practice um, and how to move this agenda forward. So who would like to start or take on one of those? We'll start this time. Yeah, so so I actually developed and give um, a lecture on, on this subject at UBC Undergraduate Medicine. And this, this was really my getting my feet wet um, and trying to become an expert in this area. So I would say uh, you can become an expert. Uh, the, 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 my co-presenters today uh, are two of my professional idols. And it's very humbling to me that two years later, I was asked to share this platform. So um, you can do it is what I would say. Uh, there's, there's a big need that's here. Um, I know that uh, I can speak for UBC anyway, that they're looking at how to integrate this across um, all aspects of undergraduate teaching, but I think it needs to get more into postgraduate teaching. And um, in, in the conversations I've had with some of my uh, colleagues, I'm, I'm mid-career, so mid and later career colleagues, um, this is not on their radar at all. And so I think that um, there's a need for um, resources CME resources at the Royal College level um, to, to, to step up um, and support physician learning across uh, our career pathway. Fiona, did you want to speak to the Cascades efforts in that respect at all? The resources available for training? Uh, I mean, we do have a fundamentals course and we're starting with CMA in partnership of a program of physician leaders and we have other sort of training programs that Cascades is moving forward. So we are um, and I think I think Carolyn's point about needing to get to people in practice is vital, um, and and clearly curriculum though I think is quite variable across the country. CFMS Heart is working very hard. The medical students are working very hard uh, to get this into. So I think it is uh, being taken up. But yeah, from Cascades' perspective, continuing professional development is certainly part of our part of our contribution. The medical students really deserve a shout out there. They've been very effective, very vocal in their campaigning. And it, and it shouldn't have had to come to med students campaigning for that. I can answer the last question if you like. Fiona, just and feel free to weigh in here, uh, both of you. Uh, the Canadian Coalition for Green Healthcare has some resources available around green infrastructure, if you will. So there's, the question is specifically around low emissions buildings and tools and such. Um, Healthcare Without Harm is a US-based advocacy organization that similarly has uh, publicly available tools and resources. Um, that may be something that we're able to offer eventually through Cascades, more on the clinical delivery side than the infrastructure side, but in terms of how to tailor the, a practice to be optimally resource efficient and low carbon and sustainable. I would add that CAPE, um, the, the Climate Change Toolkit for Health Professionals, which CAPE no longer has on their website, but you can still find it. Chase has it and others. Uh, that's a useful resource with, again, the office perspective. Cascades does have and is building a suite 
of primers and infographics that are more clinically focused opportunities in clinical areas. Um, so that's certainly something that's particularly clinically near is, is as cascades, I think, uh, very much where we think there's value add contribution to make. So, um, but yes, right now it's a bit scattered, um, but there are resources certainly. Um, and with that, I, uh, is this talk going to be posted somewhere so that we can link to it? Yes, we believe that it will be in due course, but CMA Jewel has a sort of a plan for this, but I think we'll, we'll go back uh, to, to our host when we're ready for, for the answer to that question. Before I hand it back to her, um, Carolyn or Andrea, do you have a final quick line you would wish to convey to the audience, uh, final messages um, that you would like them to hear? I would say thank you for caring and spread the message of care. I mean, this is this is bigger than us. This is bigger than our medical practice. We need to live differently. That's the bottom line. We don't have to suffer. We just have to live differently. And I would add to that that this is not additional to other core values within medical practice. This is part of patient safety, quality, equity, um, social value creation, all the things that we are aiming for as health professionals. So do not consider this in competition with those as some sort of, sort of competing priority, but part and parcel with the high quality equitable care. Great, thank you so very much for this. And I'm gonna pass it back to Courtney to close the session for this, for the CMA.